During the 1930s, newsreels provided moving, living glimpses of distant places and important people. A few sophisticated American politicians realized what a wonderful outlet newsreel companies were providing them. And one of the most ardent users was Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Let me warn you and let me warn the nation against the smooth evasion that says, of course we believe these things. We believe in social security. We believe in work for the unemployed. We believe in saving homes. Cross our hearts and hope to die. We believe in all these things. But we do not like the way the present administration is doing them. Just turn them over to us. We will do all of them. We will do more of them. We will do them better. And most important of all, the doing of them will not cost anybody anything. <laughs> Dr. Joseph Goebbels, Minister of Propaganda, directly controlled the one and only newsreel company in Germany. Nazi leaders made the newsreel screen a vehicle for projecting a controlled image of Adolf Hitler. It is our wish and will that this state and this Reich bestehen sollen in the coming Jahrtausenden. We can be happy to know that this future Rechtlos uns gehört. Wenn die älteren Jahrgänge noch wanken werden könnten, die Jugend ist uns verschrieben und da fallen mit Leib und mit Seele. This is a newsreel theater recreated by the Smithsonian Institution in Washington. We'll be talking about style and charisma and how the media were used by Franklin Roosevelt and Adolf Hitler. FDR would be the first president to fully utilize radio, and Hitler would be the first politician to take advantage of sound movies. His ranting oratory and political spectacles were particularly well suited to the new medium. Radio and sound movies would enable Roosevelt to lift up the spirits of a depressed nation and Hitler to control the mind of Germany. Newly completed Rockefeller Center became known for the radio networks it housed. Radio was entertainment and news broadcasts provided a remarkable window for Americans locked to their living room radios by the Depression. It was the Roosevelt voice most Americans knew first and have remembered longest. It wasn't just his words, Lincoln's were better, so were Wilson's. But radio gave us the sound of the man. He sounded like a bell in the darkness, not just announcing the light, commanding it. A state of mind as much as anything produced the Great Depression. A different state of mind could commence the cure. FDR knew that and said about it. The bank holiday, while resulting in many cases in great inconvenience, is affording us the opportunity to supply the currency necessary to meet the situation. No sound bank is a dollar worse off than it was when it closed its doors. Let me make it clear that the banks will take care of all needs. During the hectic spring of 1933, the newly elected Franklin Roosevelt generated entire legislative programs with his voice alone. His first fireside chat bypassed Congress by addressing the mass audience of radio's open forum. You people must have faith. You must not be stampeded by rumors or guesses. Let us unite in banishing fear. He had a very high tenor voice and a very, a very elitist uh, kind, of, um, kind of delivery. 
he spoke like a Harvard man. And we thought that this would be a handicap, but of course it wasn't. Everybody said this man must be pretty good, you know. And so he was, uh, he was put down, finally, when he came to be president as a great orator. And this surprised all of us who had been close to him before. In Germany, on March 13th, 1933, the day following Roosevelt's initial fireside chat, an inner circle functionary of the Nazi party, Dr. Joseph Goebbels, was appointed head of the Ministry of Propaganda. Under Goebbels' direction, revolutionary new methods were devised to envelop Germany in the sound of Nazism. Radio, the arts, the press, and movies issued a single message. As Hitler wrote, the propaganda must confine itself to a very few points and repeat them endlessly. One mind, one body, all moving together. Fanaticism, Hitler declared, rules the masses. Film director Lenny Riefenstahl was told to capture that spirit. She was given virtually unlimited funds and put in charge of staging for film, the spectacle of a people affirming the Nazi litany in numbing cadence. symbol of the NRA, the National Recovery Administration, rallied the energetic but somewhat haphazard support of most Americans. They marched willingly, if out of step, towards prosperity. Roosevelt's ad lib programs, his stopgap legislation inspired high spirits and loud opposition from men like Senator Huey Long of Louisiana. I advised our Roosevelt administration at the United States Senate that they were making a serious mistake when they began the NRA. They sat up and called General U.S. Johnson down here to take charge of that particular newly created government. And they began to prescribe a code for the man that was a washing and a code for the man that was a present and a code for the man that was a milking and a code for the man that was making candlesticks. Under attack, Roosevelt was all grace and unflappable. Now we're off on a week's holiday. Four members of the Roosevelt family got a beautiful day. We hope to have a very successful cruise along the coast. 
Rights of spring in Nazi Germany, 1933, were the burning of books judged unfit by the state. And on the night they burned, Joseph Goebbels' cry was a doleful warning of terror to come. After all, if they could destroy books, they could alter civilization. The era of exaggerated Jewish intellectualism is now finished and the way is freed for a German course of action. So they would flee the terror. Physicist Albert Einstein, musician Bruno Walter, author Thomas Mann, architect Walter Gropius, Playwright, Bertolt Brecht. Film director, Fritz Lang. From the outset, the Nazis were advancing along the outline of a blueprint designed by Adolf Hitler. In his testament, Mein Kampf. Recovery in America centered on Roosevelt's ability to react quickly to each crisis. For the wandering unemployed, blighting America's cities, Roosevelt supplied an alphabet soup of recovery programs. New work projects sprang up. The CCC, Civilian Conservation Corps, the WPA, Works Project Administration, the great TVA, Tennessee Valley Authority, all this put the unemployed on government payrolls. Maybe every park and road was not absolutely necessary, but there was a matter of pride in being back at work. In their distinctive ways, the United States and Germany were pushed toward recovery. In a way, what they, what they did was comparable to meet the uh, problems of the Depression. But Roosevelt did it in a democratic way, and Hitler, of course, did it in the authoritarian way, which he went on with later. Hitler felt it was necessary in the beginning to convince Germans that he could make the economy prosperous and he tried to make rebuilding a matter of faith. At that time, we suffered for four years, and we want to use these four years for the benefit of our people, particularly for the German worker. Typically, Hitler did not plunge into action. He moved tentatively, testing the obstacles. Once he knew the strength of his opposition, he moved vigorously. Ground was broken for the most impressive set of superhighways in the world with the statement that work and the giving of our flesh to our country is our destiny. And how prophetic that statement would be when applied to one of the closest henchmen in the inner circle, Captain Ernst Röhm. Röhm's stormtroopers had been the stepping stone of Hitler's rise, his street thug. With Hitler consolidated in power, Röhm felt his troops were being ignored and said so. Privately, he considered revolution against Hitler's alliances with the industrialists. Goebbels uncovered the plot and informed Hitler of Röhm's potential treason. Röhm was murdered on the night of the Long Knives. The title given his execution by Hitler was taken from Röhm's own vocabulary of threats. The Night of the Long Knives marked the start of German rearmament. The Versailles Treaty restrictions on the size of the German army were brushed aside. By the winter of 1934, the German military had been placed on a war footing. Hitler announced that Germany had gained liberty of action in defense matters. Compulsory military service began. The German army increased fivefold. Hitler was preparing for war. Hitler had been slapped briskly on the wrist by Franklin Roosevelt for his stance on rearmament and by French and British diplomats as well. 
Verbally, Hitler placated all his antagonists and absolutely ignored their injunctions to stop rearming Germany. Ironically, the challenges stopped as the German army grew larger, stronger, and more menacing. The expansion of military spending welded the German industrial establishment more tightly into the Nazi orbit. With the economy brightening and military strength growing, Hitler cynically demanded not war, but peace. Whoever lights the torch of war in Europe, he said, can expect nothing but chaos. Roosevelt was um, very curious about Hitler and often spoke about him and what he was doing and uh, said that the uh, measures he was taking were obviously meant to enhance German power and thought that he meant to uh, to start a new war just as the old one was uh, petering out. One voice of protest was Senator Gerald Nye, outraged by a magazine expose of munitions makers as war profiteers. Actions in Germany and elsewhere speak rather loudly of a world bent upon more war. There is but one war that I would like to see this world engage in. That is a war which would find civilization making war against the private munitions makers the world over. Success for civilization in such a war, I think, would rather clearly reveal what is largely behind this agitation for larger preparation for war. Pushed by Nye's righteous anger, America turned toward formal non-involvement. In August of 1935, the first Neutrality Act was passed by Congress. Roosevelt reluctantly signed the bill. Neutrality, after all, was only one of many pressures he had to deal with. Senator Hiram Johnson led congressional isolationists Louisiana's Huey Long, a political challenger, led the extremist opposition to Roosevelt's economic policies. Share the wealth was Long's platform and insistent cry. Father Charles E. Coughlin propagandized against America's joining the world court and claimed a personal victory over Roosevelt. He gathered an anti-Roosevelt coalition around him, preaching, think Christian, act Christian, and beware of world Jewry. William Randolph Hearst condemned Roosevelt's New Deal, calling it the Raw Deal. And McCormick's Chicago Tribune was persuading readers that Roosevelt's administration would bring only destruction. People of America, know the heart and know the purpose of their government. They and we will not retreat. Roosevelt turned to his constituency, the ordinary people. The thin veneer of snow covered the parched plains of America. For the first time in five years of depression, a glimmer of light could be seen on the horizon. A time for hoping, it was a time for smiling, it was a time when the brave words heralding the fight against fear seemed to have real meaning. Behind the snows of winter came the melting runoff that doused the dust-dry land, and it was terrible, and it would be overcome. What I have seen confirms me in the belief that I've had for a long time that we're going to win on this problem. To keep people going who've lost their crops and lost their livestock. A cooperation with nature.
Russia, instead of going along with what we've been doing in the past, trying to buck nature. We've got to have the cooperation of the people in the cities, as well as the people on the farms. It's just as much their problem as it is the problem of the farmers themselves. Incidentally, in an agricultural country, there wouldn't be any cities if there weren't farms. There was anger in his voice. His new deal had been attacked. He took it personally, and he lashed back at his critics. Are you willing to turn America over to those who in past years shut their eyes to the problems of the nation? For nearly four years now, you have had an administration which instead of twirling its thumbs has rolled up its sleeves. And I can assure you that we will keep our sleeves rolled up. <laughs> Despite what happens in continents overseas, the United States of America shall and must remain unentangled and free. In 1936, the German army marched into the demilitarized Rhineland. Hitler convinced the German people they were retaking what was theirs. In the event of opposition, their orders were to retreat. There was no opposition. So it was just two months after the Rhineland expedition that the world convened in Berlin under Hitler's watchful eye to celebrate international goodwill in the form of sports. Timing had given Adolf Hitler a propaganda victory. He made it his Olympics. The depression was easing in both the United States and Germany for different reasons. Hitler had identified the villains as far as Germany was concerned. He charged that economic sanctions had been the responsibility of the Allied powers of World War I principally France, Britain, and the United States. He used the need for vengeance to rally support for him and propel Germany toward recovery. Hitler's view was almost entirely outward, the expansion of Germany's shrunken frontiers. That was the goal he set for his country. Roosevelt, on the other hand, moved America inward in the first recovery years. He focused the energy of the government on the urgent problems of domestic turmoil. The Neutrality Act of 1935 was America's signal to troubled Europe and warring Asia that the U.S. was not ready to get into their affairs. Having personally witnessed President Wilson's defeats in the cause of internationalism, FDR had no appetite for foreign entanglements. And we seemed for the moment secure from the fire that was about to consume Europe. Ardent users was Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Let me warn you, and let me warn the nation against the smooth evasion that says 
Of course we believe these things. We believe in social security. We believe in work for the unemployed. We believe in saving homes. Cross our hearts and hope to die. We believe in all these things. But we do not like the way the present administration Und da fallen mit Leib und This is a newsreel theater recreated by the Smithsonian Institution in Washington. We'll be talking about style and charisma and how the media were used by Franklin Roosevelt and Adolf Hitler. FDR would be the first president to fully utilize radio, and Hitler would be the first politician to take advantage of sound movies. His ranting oratory and political spectacles were particularly well suited to the new medium. Radio and sound movies would enable Roosevelt to lift up the spirits of a depressed nation, and Hitler... During the 1930s, newsreels provided moving, living glimpses of distant places and important people. A few sophisticated American politicians realized what a wonderful outlet newsreel companies were providing them. And one of the most... ...is doing them. Just turn them over to us. We will do all of them. We will do more of them. We will do them better. And most important of all, the doing of them will not cost anybody anything. <laughs> Dr. Joseph Goebbels, Minister of Propaganda, directly controlled the one and only newsreel company in Germany. Nazi leaders made the newsreel screen a vehicle for projecting a controlled image of Adolf Hitler. Es ist unser Wunsch und Wille, dass dieser Staat und dieses Reich bestehen sollen in den kommenden Jahrtausenden. Wir können glücklich sein zu wissen, dass diese Zukunft Rechtlos uns gehört. Wenn die älteren Jahrgänge noch wanken werden könnten, die Jugend ist uns verschrieben. <lacht> 